Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here today, uh, even on this rainy day. Uh, one thing I want to really point out to you, this next week, I don't know if you know this, it's Easter, right? <laughs> it's coming. So on Saturday, we have our Easter egg hunt uh, here at the church for our community. And so if, if we want to invite you to come out here and help us uh, do that for our community, invite your neighbors, your friends, uh, anybody you know that uh, may be interested in that so they can come and uh, and hear about Jesus and get some candy for their kids. Probably way too much. So, you know, if you have kids, you know, maybe you can take some of it. They won't know. Uh, but you can also bring them and they have some other games and they'll have some hot dogs and food and stuff as well. And so lots of things uh, going on. So that's starting this Saturday at 1130. And so if you can help with that, uh, make plans to be here. And we can also still use a lot of individually wrapped candy. And so if you can help with that, just bring some by the church uh, anytime this week or tonight. Uh, but it has to be individually wrapped for us to be able to use it. So if you can help out that, that'd be fantastic. And then the next uh, day, Sunday, week from today is Easter. So as always, man, we want to encourage you to invite anyone you know that needs to know about Jesus. Uh, what a great way for them to get plugged into a church and plugged into maybe even knowing and starting our relationship with Jesus then on Easter Sunday. So uh, what a great opportunity that we have to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus this week. So, And then also this Wednesday, uh, for our youth families, we're going to be having our parent night. So if you have a student in the youth ministry, we want to invite you to come join us this Wednesday at 630 uh, for a time of Bible study and games and fun stuff as well. So uh, lots of good times there too. So make plans to join us this Wednesday at 6.30 if you have a student in the youth group. So if you're visiting with us today, I mean, we are so glad that you're able to come here and be with us. There should be a card in the back seat in front of you, just a blue card. If you can fill it out for us, we would just love to get to know you and your family and see how we may be able to serve you in whatever way that may be. So, but right now, let's just stand and find something around you this morning and just tell them how great of a day it is. back to your seats. Please remain standing. As you make your way back to your seats, please remain standing. We'll be singing songs of praise this morning. You notice things look quite different. The choir is dressed uh, in a very similar fashion. Our, our instruments are a little different this morning. For our focus this morning is on the cross of Jesus Christ and all that he did for us there. So they'll be presenting a mini musical to that effect uh, here in a little bit as we prepare our hearts uh, for the Lord's Supper that we'll partake of here in a few minutes. Our instrumentation is different this morning. We're thankful for our, our musicians that are here with us. Their names will appear on the screens with the songs that they're playing. But as we s sing together this morning, uh, we're going to share three songs together. There is a fountain, the old rugged cross, and at the cross. Let's share those now.
we got some kids? Come on, boys. Come here, sit here with me. We're missing a lot today. No, we're not. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Probably not about the best way to come. It's just the boys. I, it's just the boys today. Okay, I got a question. If you were super duper excited, someone was coming. Do you think this would be appropriate? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. I think so too. If you were super duper excited somebody was coming, do you think a present would be appropriate? Yeah. Oh, me too. You don't? Oh, I do. I think a present would be amazing. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you something. And you guys looked at this in Sunday school today, and I know you did. But do you remember what the Bible said? Quite actually, yeah, I'm just going to still, I'll stay in Matthew. The Bible says that Jesus was coming to a town and the people were super excited. But listen to what it says. A very large, large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees or palm branches and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. That was pretty exciting. Okay, now, would you ever think laying your coat on the ground and leaves on the ground would say you're exciting, excited? Yeah. No. Would, I, I wouldn't, I, you know. If no. you did that for me, I wouldn't think it was all that great. In fact, I'd probably walk over your coat, I'm going to tell you. But you know what? Back in Jesus' time, that was an amazing thing to do. Well, guess what I got for you today? What? I got for you some real palm branches in my bucket that says flower. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to pray first, but what we're going to do is we're going to practice something. I'm going to give each of you two palms because I got a lot. I'm going to give each of you two, two palms, but listen, okay, you got to look at me. We're going to walk down that aisle and I want you to wave your palm branches and can you shout Hosanna? Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Okay, but now listen, look at me. I need eyes on me. No running. Okay. I, 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 I knew you would. There's no running. Can you do that? Because mm -hmm. you know what? I think this is a pretty cool day to do that, don't you? Okay, let's, oh, I think it's an awesome day. Let's pray, and then I'm going to give you your palm branches, okay? Dear God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for what it means. Thank you. Thank you that you sent your son to die for us. Thank you that he came into the city, and the people, even though they really didn't know exactly who he was, they knew it was somebody exciting coming. Thank you so much for these children and their willingness to learn. Thank you so much for all that you've given us. In your name, amen. Lord, teach us to pray. This was the request of one of the disciples who had observed Jesus in prayer countless times during his earthly ministry. The prayers of Jesus recorded in scripture are perfect models for our own prayer life. For though Jesus was God incarnate, the scriptures tell us he had, he had to be, be one of us so that he could serve God as our merciful and faithful high priest and sacrificed himself for the forgiveness of our sins. And now that Jesus has suffered and was tempted, he can help anyone else who is tempted. Even as Jesus hung on the cross, suffering for the sins of the world, he prayed. 
Of the seven words spoken on, by Jesus on the cross, three are prayers. Prayers that grew out of his own grief and pain and his love and mercy for each of us. These prayers may serve to help us as we too pour out our deepest petitions to our loving God. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing.
Jesus preached forgiveness throughout his ministry. With eyes of forgiveness, he must have looked down from the cross upon the crowds who mocked him, even as he hung there, dying for their sins. They cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then Jesus said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Once again, Jesus forgave. This time, the repentant sinner hanging on the cross next to his own. Though life was ebbing from his own body, Jesus was still more concerned about the needs of others the needs of a stranger, a thief on the cross, and also the needs of those he knew most closely. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Yes, Jesus cared deeply and completely for all who felt alone, abandoned, forsaken. Even he felt abandoned as he was separated from God by the weight of our sins. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me?
there's only one God, and Christ Jesus is the only one who can bring us to God. Jesus was truly human, and he gave himself to rescue all of us. Yes, Jesus was truly human, yet only once through those hours of agony did he express his own human need. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar full of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it. Put, put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Jesus recognized that his suffering was over. His task on earth was now accomplished. When he, when had, he had finished the drink, Jesus, Jesus said, It is finished. finished. Then, then he bowed his head and, and gave, gave up, up his spirit. spirit. And finally, Jesus prayed the prayer that had first been uttered by the psalmist, a prayer that we, as God's children, must pray daily as we entrust our lives to God's tender care. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last.
this morning, the choir has presented to you prayers at the cross. I want to talk to you for a few moments about memories on the cross. And if you've got your Bible in hand, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter. The Gospels, when they are combined together, give us a very complete picture of what happened that day. Mark informs us that it was in the third hour, 9 a.m., when they crucified him. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree that from the sixth hour, which is noon, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. At that time, Jesus cried out to the Father, bowed his head, and gave up his spirit. During his hours on the cross, Jesus experienced agony, suffering so great that I doubt any of us in this room can begin to understand its intensity. There were conversations he participated in. Familiar voices that he heard. Faces that he saw. I want us to consider what John recorded happened during this time frame. So if you have your Bible open to John chapter 19, I invite you to find verse 23. And having found it, I would invite you, if you will, and if you can, to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's holy word. Here is how John recorded the events of that time and that day. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now, the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, And his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, To fulfill the scripture said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Pray with me. Father, this morning, I I ask you to bless the reading of your word. Help us to see and understand the depth of your love, the suffering and the agony that you were willing to allow your son to suffer in our place. Father, as we continue through this time of worship, as we consider your word, as we consider our hearts and lives, as we participate in or observe the Lord's Supper, may we be reminded the great length to which you would go to make us your own. Father, bless this time of worship. Speak to our hearts. Show us your truth. For we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We read it and it seems so brief. But for him, it was hours 
of agony, hours of pain, of, of feelings and images recalled, memories of moments in his life that ran through his mind. That, that's how the human brain works. We see something, we hear something, we smell something, and it, it triggers a memory. The choir sang about prayers from the cross. I want to think for a few moments about memories on the cross. Our Lord looked down and he saw the soldiers dividing his garments. He was watching those who had nailed him to the cross just moments before. They took his outer garments and they made four parts, a part for each soldier. But it also tells us there that there was a tunic which was seamless and it was woven in one piece. And rather than having it torn and destroyed so that the pieces of material would continue to fray out, John tells us, Matthew tells us that they instead engaged in a game of chance to see who would get that garment by casting lots. Jesus watched them gambling for his garments, and probably in his mind he recalled the night before. In the upper room, where he gathered with his disciples, John tells us that the Lord got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself, and then he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. All of that memory was replaying in his mind as he watched those soldiers take possession of his garment. That which had covered him during his time of ministry, his travels, his teaching, his healing, it was now simply the prize for a game of chance. He looked and he saw his mother and a friend, his family and friends. I, it's strange how in times of trauma we think about people we love, isn't it? But there she was, his mother. She, she never abandoned him. She didn't understand everything that happened in his life. There were things I'm sure that she questioned and times when she wondered, Lord, what have you asked me to do? But But she was there. She was there to watch her child die. Even in this difficult moment, there she stood, near the cross, not caring what the Romans thought, not caring what the religious leaders of the Jewish people thought. She would not abandon her child. You mamas understand that, don't you? Jesus saw the others there. And he realized, I can't leave my mother unprovided for. He saw his friend. The disciple whom he loved. John would not name himself. So he identified himself. You say, well, that's kind of egotistical, isn't it, to call himself the one whom he loved? No. In fact, if you look back in John chapter 13, verse 23, there, as John recorded the events of that upper room, he tells us that he was reclining on Jesus' bosom. He was leaning on his shoulder. There was a relationship there that is beyond our understanding. As they shared their final meal, celebrating that last Passover together, they were close. As Jesus hung dying upon the cross, John refused to leave him. No matter what it might cost, he was going to be there next to his friend, next to his Lord, next to his Savior. In those final moments. And Jesus, as he hung upon that Roman cross, 
He entrusted the care of his closest and most vulnerable family member, his mother, to this dear friend. The hours dragged by. In the mind of the Lord, he was thinking about his mission. John records the final moments of Jesus' life very simply. It begins at verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been fulfilled to fulfill the Scripture, said, I'm thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there. They put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received that sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, gave up his spirit. He had completed his mission. Everything the Father had planned for him to do, he had done. And now everything was positioned for the final act. We celebrate that next week. It was time to go home. The suffering, the agony, the pain it was over. Now he got to go home to be with the Father. You would think that those gathered around the cross, perhaps now they understand. No. Those who had been with him in the upper room the evening before, they had not understood the words that he had spoken. They didn't get it. They still had questions that were unanswered. They, they understood the Passover. They understood the unleavened bread. They understood the fruit of the vine. They understood these things. After all, it was Passover. This was what they had done all their lives. This is what their families had done for generations untold all the way back to Egypt. But what was this about a broken body and shed blood? Perhaps now they could understand. Thank you for letting me ramble a little bit this morning. I've often wondered what went through the mind of Jesus as he hung on the cross. I'm certainly not qualified to tell you what was going through the mind of God, God in flesh, as he hung suspended there between heaven and earth, knowing that his journey among mankind was nearing its conclusion. But I can tell you what I do know. I can tell you that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for me. I can tell you that when he was hanging there, I was on his mind. He took my sin upon himself. He paid the debt that I owed and that I am incapable of paying. He suffered. He bled. He died because I am a sinner. And the wages of sin is death. Years ago, years ago, I accepted his gift of forgiveness. I accepted his redemption and new life. I trusted by faith that he is the son of God, that he has paid my sin debt in full. And in doing so, he restored me to a right and full relationship with my heavenly father. He did for me what I could never do for myself. He paid my price. And he paid yours. Did you hear me? He paid yours. The question is simply this. Have you received his gift? No one forces it on anyone. God offers it freely. Men, women, boys and girls throughout the ages have come to him and received his gift, and you can receive it today. You can receive it just like I did, by faith, believing that he is who he said he was, 
that he did what he said he would do, and that he has fulfilled God's purpose. If you'd like to receive that gift, man, I'd love to assist you in getting it done. I want to ask you if you would just to bow your heads. We're going to take these next few moments to remember and to think on what Jesus did for us. How that affects the way that we live today and every day. We, we need to consider this as we prepare to partake from this table. And the purpose of this table is to commemorate his life, his atoning death, his glorious resurrection. That which he has done for us and that which he offers to us. If you've not prepared yourself, I pray that you will during this time. Allow his spirit to speak to your heart. If there's unconfessed sin, confess it. If there's a broken relationship, commit yourself to heal it. If you're not right with him, repent, come to him. If you need a relationship with him, you don't have him. You and I need to talk. Because I'd love to tell you all about my Jesus. Take these moments. Prepare your heart to celebrate what he's given for you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. The price that was paid. Lord, a price we could never pay for ourselves. Through the broken body, the shed blood, we are given hope, forgiveness, life, and a future. Father, I pray that in these moments, as we focus our hearts and our minds on our Lord, what He has done for us, and what He still stands ready to do today, convict us of sin. Draw us to the cross. Point us toward the Savior. And break our hearts that we might be willing to surrender all to Him. Father, this is my prayer. This is my prayer. And I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Have your way, Father. And be glorified in us, through us. Do what pleases you with us. But we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing this song of invitation, just a couple of verses. If you need to come, I invite you to come. If you need to talk to him right where you are, you do that. But what you need to do, do quickly while we sing. I hear the Savior say, thy strength. a seat. I want to invite our deacons who are here this morning will be serving us to come and 
join us here on these front rows. Allow you gentlemen to be seated there. While they're coming and finding a seat, I, I want to share with you that as God's people, we are instructed in the Word of God periodically to observe this supper. It's a time of remembrance of what our Lord has done. I want to invite those of you who are here who are born-again believers. You know that you have a personal relationship with your Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Please join in with us. If you're here and you don't know that you have that relationship, you're not certain that you are a child of God, you're struggling with that, haven't figured that out yet, I want to encourage you not to participate, but to observe what occurs here. And I know that there are some who have told me through the years that, Pastor, that's, that's offensive. No, it's not offensive, it's protective. See, it's not our desire to exclude people, but it's our desire to protect people because God's Word states that whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So this morning as we come to this table to remember what occurred in the upper room where Jesus and his disciples were gathered to celebrate that last Passover meal, I, I want to encourage you to be certain of your heart, your condition, your place within the kingdom. Because the broken body, the shed blood of the Son of God, is not a matter to be taken lightly, but rather to be taken reverently, understanding that this, this is a holy and sacred moment. I want to invite you gentlemen, if you would, to join me here at the table. On the evening that Jesus was betrayed, as he celebrated that, that feast of the Passover with his disciples for the last time, we read in Luke's gospel that when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Today we remember what he's done. Today we come to celebrate in that even as we struggle with the pain and the agony that he endured. Let us not take lightly that which God has given at such great expense. Let's pray together. Father, our hearts are full and yet heavy at the same time. How great your love, how deep your pain. How great your gift. Father, I pray that this morning, as we celebrate, participate, and remember together, that we will be in awe of the broken body of our Lord and what he was willing to give, that we might know life, abundant and eternal. Thank you for such a sacrifice. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our Lord himself said, this is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate in the wilderness and died, but he who eats of this bread will live forever. Thank you for that bread. In his record of what occurred in the upper room, Luke then tells us that the same way he took the cup. And after they had eaten, he told them, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. My friends, each time we come together, we are reminded that Jesus paid it all. We could not, but he did. If you gentlemen would come and join me here, let's pray before we take these trays, this cup, and serve God's people. Father, we are thankful for the shed blood of Christ because we know that without that blood, there is no hope for us. There is no redemption. There is no forgiveness. There is no salvation. Father, thank you for loving us and for giving your son to pay our price. Bless your people as they participate together. And remember, may this be the reminder that we carry through the days to come. But we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
the writer of the letter to the Hebrews, understanding Jewish law much better than any of us, pointed out to his readers that according to the law, one may almost say that all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So as we celebrate and partake today, we should be reminded, God has done what only God can do. Let us praise him and rejoice in that. I want to invite you, if you would, to pass those cups toward the center aisles. Some of our deacons will pass by and pick those up. You see, it was in a manner something similar to this, that the Lord and his disciples ate the bread, drank the cup, and in doing that, they instituted the Lord's Supper to be carried out as a reminder to help us remember what he's done. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, and he told them, as often as you do this, as often as you eat the bread and, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. And don't leave off the last phrase. Until he comes. Jesus is coming again. And we will remember and we will celebrate until the day he comes and takes his bride home. Matthew tells us in his gospel that after Jesus and his friends had celebrated that Passover meal together, he says, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. They went out so that the Lord could continue his service as he headed toward the cross. And this morning, we're going to follow their example by singing our closing benediction and making our way back to our field of service. Each time that we gather as a church body and celebrate the Lord's Supper, we also take the opportunity to offer to all of ourselves an opportunity to be a part of a benevolence offering. Our deacons will be standing by the doors. If you'd like to participate, do so. If not, bless you, go with the Lord. This money that's collected in these plates this morning as we leave, it is not used to pay the bills, to pay salaries, to turn the lights on and off or anything else. It is used when people come to our door needing assistance, needing help. And we have the opportunity to minister to them in the name of Jesus. So, as we get ready to do these things, let's go and serve the Lord with glad hearts for what he has done for us. Let's stand together and let's join our hearts and our voices together in singing our closing benediction. To the old rocket cross, I will add.